that to me is where the, 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 the powerful bit of music comes from. It helps people accept people, you know, and accept each other. And, and I think, you know, especially when you look at the way the world is at the moment, that's something that's desperately needed. Whenever I say that phrase, the music that made me, what's the first thing that comes into your head? The music that made me. Um, I think back mostly to uh, why I started making music, which was, you know, really about when I was about 14. <laughs> I can remember seeing uh, David Bowie, 1972. So actually, I was 13, but um, and he was on uh, Top of the Pops, and he had that song. And he was like, you know, I had to call someone, so I picked on you, and he pointed out to the screen, and I thought, he's pointing at me. I know he's pointing at me, you know, because you imagine all kinds of nonsense when you're young. Like, if you look at the background of Top of the Pops, and you see like, you know teenagers dancing around they look so different compared to david bowie it's like it's he's really is like an alien from another planet i saw him as you know some kind of oddity something strange that was was interesting but it wasn't until i got to uh low in 1977 i still listen to that record probably twice a month driving around in my car what was good about it was it it was came out in the same year as the clash's first album which i loved as well and so put those two things together that gave us the feeling where we could do something that would change things. I always remember I was listening to, well, I had low and I went to a party one night and somebody played Sound of Vision. It's very, you know, catchy in its own way and, and makes people want to, you know, dance and talk to each other and stuff. It, but... The other thing about it is the lyrics are so so strange and that really freed me because I, I realised, OK, I could write something and play something that was like would, would take hold of people, but it didn't have to be simplistic. It didn't have to be like Moon in June and, you know, uh, you know that kind of lyric. It could be something uh, that reflected what I really thought about stuff. So, you know, that, that was a revelation. That, that's really when he hit me, I think, you know. When we first started, you know, and, it, and, it, and it, I know it used to annoy Robert, so he would give funny answers, but, um, you know, we'd be somewhere and people would go, well, what do you call your music? And Robert would just say, well, it's Cure Music. But if I think about it from, you know, many years hence, I look at it and I think with a lot of it, we were, we were kind of like a psychedelic punk group when we started out, really. 1977, you had to disown the fact that you'd ever heard any of this stuff beforehand. You know, it was like a new dawn, and that's all you could have, you know. No, I only ever listened to The Clash and Buzzcocks and, uh, you know, Elvis Costello. But, of course, that's not true, you know. We'd listened to all this stuff beforehand. Is there any mm. of the psychedelic stuff that you'll admit to nowadays? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, some some of the early uh, F Floyd, you know, with Sid Barrett was great and that, and we liked... I mean, it's not really psychedelic, it's like more sort of insane Captain Beefheart, you know, Trout Mask Replica, that was a great record. Got some for me, got some for you. She shows something. Even Genesis, when they had Gabriel, were good. My favourite album of The Cure that we ever did was Pornography. And the, the reason I like Pornography is because, as people at the time, we were in a very uh, strange place and we were kind of falling apart. But the music is very precise and intense 
And that's the thing that kept us together. Now, fast forward, this record we made was not like that because we have a different perspective, we have a different way of being now. But in lots of ways, it was the same because it's very intense. But at the very end, the last track, James Murphy is singing on it, and it's the same as at the end of pornography. Because people always think to me, say to me, pornography is very, very uh, hard album and very dark and that. And I said, well, yes, but if you listen, like the last line is like, you know, I have to find a cure. I have to, you know, it's, there's some salvation coming at the end of it, and that's the same thing I wanted for us to do at the end of this record. And I think, you know, we all agreed about that. And so, it, it sounds. Well, I'll wait until you hear it. It sounds very hopeful at the end. Got a ways to go. I think that's what people relate to in music, that, that they, they see you, they see who you are. Last time I went back and played with The Cure in 2011, we went to Australia uh, first to play, and... That's exactly what I got when I walked on stage. I realized, oh, this is like this this little feedback loop, which is why when people always said to me, oh, you know, you play this dark music and maybe it makes people more depressed and makes them, you know, feel bad about themselves. I said, no, the opposite's true, you know. People get solace from this stuff. And she feeds you tea and oranges that come all the way from China. For you, are there are there songs that when you've been through hard times that you've you know that you've so movingly written about in the past, um, are there songs that you've gone to that have helped you in those moments? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm I'm just going to look it up because I have, um, you know, I I have a playlist which is kind of funny because um, oh, is it? it's not funny, but it's. Um, <laughs> I, I told my son, I said, okay, well, when, when you know, when I when I go, because, you know, none of us is getting out of here alive, um, when I go, I'm going to make a playlist, you know, which is on my demise, that's what it's called, right? And I'm constantly updating it. It's about five hours worth now, so, you know, it's going to be a long, bloody funeral. But anyway, um, so songs on there I listen to that make me... Uh, you know, some of them make me happy. Some of them make me th like they have this a solace of stuff. Mm. Uh, I think the first one is the oldest one, probably uh, Leonard, a Leonard Cohen song, Suzanne, and I love that line in it that says, "You know, she brings me tea and oranges that come all the way from China, right?" And and so I, for some reason I find that very comforting. And so whenever I have a cup of tea. Um, I always have to have an orange with it if I can. I've been doing some growing, but I'm scared of you going, so say you don't mind. When we did the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing, they have a dinner the night before the, the event, and, you know, you can go to it. And, and, and so I went to it, and I was telling somebody how, how I was really happy that the zombies were playing because... Colin Bluntstone, a singer. When I was 13, he made a solo single called Say You Don't Mind. It was the first time as a young man that I realised, you know, because I was like 13, that I realised you could write a lyric that would be uh, vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know, like like from that kind of point of view and, and be open about your feelings. Uh, and that helped me a lot. So generally, the songs that I like, that I love... The songs that I get that from. <laughs> 